I'm Michael Locati, by the way, and my wife, Melissa, uh, we're the co-owners here, and um, this is about our third year in Bucks County, so this is our very first lecture event, so we're excited to do this. Uh, we thought with this terrific collection, it'd be fun to have um, a real expert come in and, and give a talk, and uh, glad so many of you came out, and we appreciate that. Um, we hold monthly auctions from June through September, uh, and we're also starting to do uh, dedicated from jewelry. September to June. September to June, that's right. Uh, so, uh, yes. And we're starting to do uh, dedicated jewelry, fine, fine watches, and coin watches as well. So, uh, if anyone has material uh, uh, in that realm, we have a gemologist that's coming in every Monday for pre appraisals. Um, so, uh, I guess with that, we'll get started. If, um, Anybody has questions for us or for Ellie? I think we'll have a little time after the lecture. And um, thanks again for coming. So welcome. But y'all can also interrupt me. I don't mind one bit. It makes it more interesting. So I think nobody would be here if you didn't know that miniatures were your portable portraits mm -hmm. until photography was invented. But I'm going to give you a little history of where they came from. The French claim they invented miniatures, but then again, so did the English. And it's been a fight since, well, I don't know, about 1530. And actually, they came in just about the same year. So this is the earliest English miniature. And you know who that is, the dreaded Henry VIII, in a wonderful enameled case by the first miniaturist who worked in England, who was Lucas Hornibold. Early on, they were all Flemish, and they were all by trade illuminated manuscript illustrators. You know, those wonderful big books that have pictures down the side and that's what they all were trained to do. And illuminated manuscripts were painted on vellum. And so vellum flopped over into miniatures. So you look at something like Henry, and it's taken straight out of a manuscript that would have had all of that on the side and his initials and that wonderful dark, dark blue color that was used so frequently in all the manuscripts. So Hornibold had a long reign as the king's miniaturist. And here are four of his queens. Anne Boleyn, who was beheaded, well, Catherine of Aragon, she was just divorced and sent away. <laughs> Anne Boleyn was beheaded. Jane Seymour died, and Catherine Parr was the last of them. She outlived him and inherited lots. <laughs> this is number five, Anne of Cleves. Fourth. Fourth. She um, and her sister, Amelia, were both on the marriage market from a little tiny duchy called Cleves. And she was purportedly the most beautiful of the two. So Henry VIII sent the then miniaturist, Hans Holbein, over to Cleves and said, take a picture of each of them and bring it back and I'll make my choice. <laughs> this is a wonderful ivory case, which is how miniatures were carried early on. That top screws on. It's, of course, fancier than most, but then again, it is a royal miniature. And this and Amelia are still in the collection of the Victoria and Albert. She was not the prettier one. Henry VIII took one look at her and said, Eesh. <laughs> And they were married for maybe six months before he left her. But she was really nice, didn't give him any trouble. So he made her rich in her own right, got
got her a castle, and she lived on being very friendly with all of his annoying children, <laughs> Mary the First and Elizabeth the First. <laughs> and here, by Nicholas Hilliard, is Elizabeth the First. Still on vellum, Nicholas was trained as a goldsmith. He was the first one who was not a painter of illuminated manuscripts. He was trained as a goldsmith. So his jewels, if you could see them, and if anybody wants to walk up, are unbelievably realistic. And then he made wonderful enamel cases besides. Now, she was as vain as a queen could be. She didn't like seeing shadows on her face. So rather than there being any dimension, only in her miniatures, his other miniatures were stunning. Face is very flat and very white because it's what she wanted. She never wanted to get old. Now, Hilliard went a very long time, too. So this is her successor, James the first and the sixth of England. He was the first king of England, James, first James king of England, but he was the sixth James of Scotland, which is where he had come from. So he was James the first and the sixth. And um, that was painted in 1609. And that is his baby boy who grew up to be Charles the first in 1605. And you can see it's a bottom of one of those twisty ivory cases. And this is one of the earliest depictions of children. Children didn't get painted a lot because miniatures were hugely expensive early on. And um, children died. Infant mortality was enormous. So people waited till that period of infant mortality was gone before they paid to have their children die. Hilliard was the first artist to paint anybody. Elizabeth I was so cheap that she refused to pay him the stipend that his father had paid, that her father had paid, to keep him exclusive to the throne. So she said, fine, you're the royal miniaturist, use the title, but go set up your own studio and get your own work because I'm not going to pay you not to paint other people. And um, so at that point, anybody who had the money, the butcher could have his miniature painted <coughs> if he wanted. This is the successor, John Hoskins, and these are three of the children of Charles I, that little baby we saw in the last one. She was purportedly a genius, very religious, could do any kind of numbers in her head, and sadly died at 13. Now, Samuel Cooper was purported to be the greatest artist in all of Europe. And he was so good that he painted Charles I. And even though he was a royal miniaturist, Cromwell went right to him because he was so good that Cromwell had to use him too. And if you look, there's a big wart there and a big wart there. And Cromwell is from, made the expression warts and all because he liked his warts. And when Cooper said, sir, should I paint the warts or not? He said, warts and all. Mm -hmm. And there are his warts. <laughs> This is Charles II's baby sister who had been sent off to France when 
the trouble started and it looked like her daddy was about to be beheaded. Mm -hmm. And she married the Duke de Orléans. And so at this point, she is the Duchess. And that one was painted 1660, which is the year that Cromwell went away and Charles II came back and brought his baby sister with him for a while. Next up was Nicholas Dixon. And this is Queen Mary II when she was the Princess of Orange. Now I should tell you something about these tacky frames. They are not original. When Queen Victoria married Prince Albert, he essentially was beyond just German. I mean, he was uber German. Everything had to be in perfect order. So he went through the miniature collection and threw away all the wonderful gold and enamel frames that had come before, I mean, right in the trash bin, mm -hmm. and had everything framed identically. Mm -hmm. And so most of the royal collection has these frames up until Albert died in the 1870s because he was a tidy house frau, or whatever you call a guy who was, and um, he wanted, he did it to the big pictures too. It wasn't just the miniatures. Everything was framed in order. All had to be salute beautiful. <coughs> and this, which didn't enter the royal collection until Queen Mary bought it at the turn of the 20th century, is the first artist paint on ivory, Bernard Lenz III. And you'll see, you can see that they got much better working on ivory, but he was the first person in England to use ivory. Now, why did they use ivory? It was slippery, it cracked, nothing stayed on it, because ivory, when painted correctly with watercolors, looked like skin. I mean, if you go back, well, Cooper could do anything, but um, they're sort of flat. When you get to ivory, you'll see here, when they really knew what they were doing, it made the skin glow. So you used thin washes of watercolor on ivory, and to make it stay, you either had to dot it or hatch it. And it took an immense amount of time. Miniatures were usually five sittings. Mm -hmm. And so they cost pretty much the same as a big oil portrait which of course you couldn't take with you. And you know, you could not send Holbein to paint Anne of Cleves on a wood panel and expect him to carry it back. So that's where ivory came from. Lenz was good. He was miniaturist to three kings, George the first, George the second, and a little bit of George III. And these are by the first miniaturist in America, which I'm proud to say was a lady. She was Mary Roberts. She lived in Charleston. And she and her husband had moved from England. He was the artist of the family. And, but the only now known work by him is a very famous panorama print of the seaport of Charleston in 1732, I believe. Every building on the whole seaport of Charleston is in this print that he made. And he was also the town printer. 
He died in 1739, and she had one son who was disabled, and she all of a sudden had to earn a living. So in 1739, the first thing you see is her offering his printing press for sale. And then the next thing you see, my favorite ad of miniatures of all time, advertising herself. And she said she offered face painting well performed. Mm -hmm. And I just love that. So these are the very aristocratic grandchildren of Arthur Middleton. Middletons were among the great colonial families of America and of England. So this is William, who grew up in America and became sheriff of Charleston. That is Williams, plural. He lived in England, uh, where their estate, which was in Sussex, was called Trublands. And um, so you have there three girls and two boys, but it was the only aristocratic commission we ever found by her. Those are now in the collection of the Met. This is the earliest one that is here. And this is a third way of painting early miniatures. This is oil on copper. And what you can't see because there's a loop in the way is this wonderful silver frame is a heart on this little boy. The, the hanging loop is in the shape of a heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know. <laughs> we love it. And, and he is absolutely adorable maybe 1730-ish, hard to tell. Children are hard to date because their clothes didn't change as rapidly as other people's clothes. Bonnets were a great thing. You may have noticed that little girls don't grow hair that all that quickly. Infant girls, go without hair a lot. You see, now everybody puts big bows on their little bald heads. But <laughs> in the 18th and 19th century, they put beautiful caps on them. You know about the date of this one because that's what's called a mop cap, which Martha Washington wore. The other two are just lacy children's caps. And there, you see a coral necklace. And you'll see that on almost all these children, both men, both boys and girls, because coral scared away the evil spirits. It didn't actually work, but they believed it. <laughs> so children, until they reached the age that childhood mortality had pretty much passed, they wore coral necklaces. Two more adorable, a mop cap and she looks bald, isn't she? Look at those cheeks. It just kills me, those big pink cheeks. <laughs> now you may think that this is a boy, but you would be wrong. Black satin high hats were actually a thing for little girls. There's one here I hadn't seen before that is about the funniest thing ever. There's your satin top hat, mm -hmm. and it's over a mock cap. <laughs> and that just, that cracks me up no end. And of course, the coral necklace. And those satin hats were very stylish for little girls until about 1830. 
you see the walking around in these little top hats. I, she's just divine. I love her. And most portraits of children had some sort of accoutrement, because what do you do with a kid's hands? An adult goes like this, but you've got the kids, they've got to do something. So that actually is a little boy with all those flowers. Now here is not a hard and fast rule, but it works 90% of the time. Little girls parted their hair down the middle, little boys on the side. Because pink and blue <coughs> doesn't work for children of this age. <coughs> Toys don't work for children of this age. You will see little girls holding whips, pulling horse toys. But that, in fact, is a boy with a basket of flowers. Why not? And I love her with the little nosegay in each hand. <laughs> There's your coral necklaces, and each one of them carries a different flower. Mm -hmm. Often flowers meant something. The language of flowers often contradicted itself, though. And usually you can tell by a broken toy or dying flowers if the child being painted had gone before. All these kids are alive. Don't get scared. Here's kids with toys. I can't tell what that is. I worried about it a while. I think it's a boy, but I'm not entirely sure because you can't see a hair part. There is a little boy with a dog toy and another little boy carrying both a whip and a pull horsey toy. Now you see how his hair's done with the bangs and then short here and then long in the back? That was an 1820s mullet. <laughs> I'm serious. That was what the style was, only for boys. We'll get to more of those in a bit. These just knock my socks off. But that is a little boy, and that is a little girl showing way too much leg, I think, <laughs> for, for modesty. If you see a full-length child, and you're not sure, as you shouldn't be with this one. The boys wore pantaloons, and their dresses were shorter. So if you just saw that, you wouldn't know if it was a boy or a girl. But because you can see all of that, you know it's a boy. And with pets, now you know that big that big old dog is real. But I question the bunny holding still <laughs> to be painted. And certainly a bird's nest with a baby bird in it holding still. Mm. But there's that wonderful top hat again. I just love that big dog. Now, how you know that children were really rich was if they carried silver rattles. There's a lot of them down here. These were the most expensive, the two layered ones. They have bells on both layers and then coral, which was a rattle and a sucky thing um, because you had to have coral somewhere. And that shows how rich you were if you could afford a silver rattle for your kid. These are just little girls with attitude. Not one of them wanted to be where they are. Oh, actually, that one's a boy. The one, the one that's pointing, look at those idiots. 
Um, <laughs> he is a boy. And he's later than most of the other ones because this mohawk thing going down the center, which when he got more hair would turn into one big stick curl, that's a boy's thing. But look at her, for goodness sake. She's going to burst into tears just looking at you. <laughs> and those two have incredibly nasty side eyes for the poor artist. <laughs> and these are just three of my favorites. Mm. Isn't that one great? I have no idea what the uniform is. I tried to find it, but. And, and sorry, is that a girl or a boy? No, it's a boy. That is the, you can't really see it. PowerPoint sort of washes out things, but he's down here somewhere. That's what was known as a skeleton suit. And those were exclusive to little boys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's what they wore after they grew out of dresses before the expression is they were trude, which is put into trousers. So the skeleton suit was sort of in betweenish, sort of five to eight years old. They wore skeletons. And then after that, they could wear long pants. This might be my favorite one, but it's hard to pick. And you can see that they are both boys because look at those mullets. <laughs> they have the bangs and then the short hair here and then all the way down the back. And that's it. <laughs> but come up and look at all of these and let's play with them. <laughs> This one here, this these this kind of frame design, and also the English one that you said was the first um, the English 18th century to use ivory, also had that kind of frame. That was not the original frame on that one. That was stuck in later. But those frames were very, very standard. Um, Great miniatures went in them. There are cheap versions. And essentially, you can tell if they're European because the Europeans had a well that um, the miniature would be in the middle, and then there would be sort of a well mm -hmm. before you hit the sides. The Americans were just flat. Mm -hmm. But that is also not a hard and fast rule. You do see British ones in these frames too, because they were sort of early on copied. Mm -hmm. And so you could buy them at Woolworths, mm -hmm. but also great artists would put their miniatures in them. The one, the Bernard Lenz, was is in the royal collection it was bought by queen mary at the turn of the 20th century and those frames were not yet invented so it went into that sometime after that how many from the collection do you think are definitively american maybe? very very few okay. they're almost all english there's only a few Europeans, too. Uh -huh. Oh, I forgot to show you this little girl with her black top hat. She's mm -hmm. just divine. Mm -hmm. And she's on paper. She's got a plume on top of everything else. <laughs> These are, there's a few Europeans, but by and large, they are. They are English. Who did the cutest children? Americans were slower about children because of the mortality. And we had a very short window of miniature painting here. 
in Europe, it never really went away. In America, the earliest ones were 1740, but it really didn't catch on until the turn of the 19th century. I mean, there was Copley painting in Boston and New York, and there's maybe 20 miniatures known by him. That was the 1750s and 60s. And um, then Ramage hit town 1775, but there weren't a pile of miniaturists working until the 1790s. After the revolution, everybody automatically, ooh, America, the streets are paved with gold. Let's get over there. Again, not a hard and fast rule, but if they were making a good living where they came from, they didn't get on that boat and take a three-month miserable ocean voyage to get here. Obviously, that wasn't true with Gilbert Stewart, um, but he only came because the debtors were getting him <laughs> in London and Dublin, where he moved to Dublin to get rid of the of his creditors in London. So there were other reasons they came here. I mean, Ramage went to Boston from Dublin because he was a bigamist and he had a couple of wives chasing him down. He did not change his ways when he moved to America. So he finally had to go to Halifax. Um, but that's a whole lecture in its own. But sort of 1790, we get a whole pile of miniatures, um, mostly French and English, but my favorite, the Miucci's. Nina was from Spain. Her husband, Antonio, was from Italy. They came in in 1818. It was a huge influx, sort of second decade of the 19th century. No other questions? Yes? Sorry, two, two questions, actually. Um, when you see hair with a child, is is that an indication the child's deceased? No. Hair just made it more personal. Mm -hmm. If you were going to travel or get on that boat going to England, and people did because their families were there. They were here. Everybody went back and forth. You weren't going to see that person for a year. If you were lucky, it was a year. Because it took you three months in each direction, so they weren't just going to have a morning meeting and get back on the boat. So the hair was something finite that had come from that person that you could hold. And adults have hair, children have hair. She's very alive and very grumpy. <laughs> this one, by the way, is an American one. <laughs> if the hair reserve on the back is off center. You're pretty sure it's an American. I have no idea why that is, but they didn't put them in the center. The Brits had a full glazed back. Look at all that hair, all beautifully woven. We never got into that. It was just a curl stuck in there without any elaborate work at all on it. Does that change later the 19th century, that idea of hair, like well into the Victorian period? Is it, is that, is it different? Is there well, meaning to that? it could mean that the person is dead, but really, unless there's something that tells you that, there's no way of knowing. But if you go through these, you're going to see There's hair. Yeah. Less hair than I would expect on these. Yeah, there's not many, uh, there's not much hair on them. <laughs> <laughs> well, in any case, it does, it does not necessarily <laughs> signify that they are dead. 
there needs to be something else there to tell you that they are gone. And there are several miniatures that have the reserve for hair in the, like a locket, but there is no hair. So could that they just have been married into those cases? Before? No, it's by and large the original cases. Okay. But at a point about 1830, you could buy cases of varying value at your local jeweler, at your local Woolworths. So if people didn't want to put hair in them, they didn't. And also, people, starting with my sister, are grossed out by hair and took them, take the hair out because they can't stand looking at it. Ew, she says. <laughs> So it could be one, it could be the other, but you could buy very inexpensive cases almost anywhere. And so people just didn't bother with them because by the 1830s, unless you were really rich, the cases weren't custom made. When did you first become passionate about portraits? Oh, I grew up with it. Mm -hmm. Then your parents also what well, my parents couldn't have cared less and to this day my mother says who wants other people's ancestors <laughs> uh, it was my great uncle and his daughter okay. who were very very passionate and um, their collection is now in the new orleans museum of art wow mm -hmm. thank you he left me a book with a broken spine called Appreciating Miniatures. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he thought I was passionate enough. Oh, that, no, that can make me feel like I was going to go and see. <laughs> but there is a book, um, small and skinny. It needs to be redone. It was done in 1975. So the photography is not what you would get today. There is a book on that collection. Yes. Do you find it difficult to sell your miniatures? I mean, to part with them? Only some. But I am of the belief, and not all dealers are of this belief, that you don't collect what you sell. So I will part with everything, That's maybe true. not instantly. Um, I do have a huge collection that has peels in it and copleys, but they're all so damaged that they could not be sold. And that's what I collect. I call it my cracked and broken collection. But it's also my study collection from when I'm teaching because I mostly do that at museums who not do not allow people to touch their stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'll show them the museum quality Charles Wilson Peel and then pass mine around. I don't care if they juggle it. They couldn't mm -hmm. get any worse than it is. <laughs> where, where will you be giving another lecture like that in the future? Anywhere near, nearby? Houston next week? <laughs> <laughs> any closer? <laughs> no. Okay. But I am doing... Uh, the Delaware show oh, okay. in a month's time. Okay. But I'm not lecturing unless you want me to talk in my booth. <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. Well, where is that show? It's in Wilmington and it is um, a benefit for the Winter Tour Museum. Is that just portraits? The show? Yeah. No, the show is everything. Okay. Your friend Taylor will be there. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Are you from this area? No, I'm from New Orleans. Oh, okay. But I live in Philly. Okay, good. <laughs> You're close. Yeah. Is this something that um, flamingos and how they tie into this tradition, or are they totally different? Well, they're not totally different, and there are miniature plumbagos. Plumbago is essentially, it grew up to be pencil. It's um, graphite, either on vellum or wove paper. And 
There were wonderful <coughs> plumbago portraits. They're not exactly miniatures, but when I see a great one that I can afford, they're earlier than this, um, mostly late 17th, early 18th century. When I see nice ones that I can afford, I, I grab them. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Now I have to look at them again. <laughs> you are definitely with a different view. Not all of them.